at the beginning of a teaching when we all generate our motivation together, it becomes a unifying factor in the group. Because then we know that everybody's here for pretty much the same reason. There's no one who, you know, is here with an ulterior purpose to, uh, you know, learn a little bit of Dharma and then change it and start their own religion. Uh, Nobody here to learn the Dharma so that then they could go out and convert other people to their religion. But we're all here um, because we want to generate compassion for each and every living being. And we're willing to exert the effort to bring that compassionate motivation into our life and to act through it to the extent that we want to transform ourselves into fully awakened beings so that we can act with compassion uh, without any hindrances from our own side. So this acts as a tremendously unifying um, motivation for a group of people sharing the teachings. And it creates trust within the group because we know we can rely on the other people to help us and give us good feedback if we start going down the slippery slope. So take a moment and renew that motivation in your mind and feel that connection with everybody here and everybody throughout the world who has that compassionate aim in life. Did you talk about the the questions? Or did you talk about the quality of the food? (laughs) That's part of wrong consciousness. Okay. Oh, it might be right consciousness. But it might be, you know, you might taste the the tomatoes or whatever it is as a, and have a direct perception but whether it's a valuable consciousness is a, you know something could be a reliable cognizer without being terribly valuable you know in the long scheme of things okay so uh let's take some of these questions um you know well look at at inattentive uh, awareness and deluded doubt, and how did they impede your understanding? So, some concrete examples. So, um, I have this little app in my uh, iPad that mm-hmm. lets me do a mind map as I'm listening to teaching so that I can capture the main ideas on a graphic form. Mm. To help me understand. But yesterday, I was so into doing my little graphic map that I missed <laughs> some of the important points. <laughs> so I was the result of inattentive awareness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that could easily happen. People could tell me that I'm lovable. But um, uh, I'm kind of not really believing it. You, that so you're what? Lovable. That I'm lovable. Lovable. Oh, okay. Yeah. And yes, then, you are. <laughs> <laughs> and then the firm in front of me comes up. Mm. <laughs> and then so I, I really have kind of doubt about that. Because mm. uh, my habit is to think rather of myself in a different yeah, way. Yeah, you think all of us are lying, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, are you accusing us of lying? So what I was working on was inventing um, another category for the inferential cognition, like a pre-inferential, mm-hmm. like kind of not even on the map yet. So I was thinking of provisional. Um, so basically I was thinking that, that my awareness is so low that it's not even up to um, 
like I'm not on that continuum of developing an inferential cognizer. Mm -hmm. So, and basically, and that was born from like uh, the habit, kind of similar to this, is that um, I'm not capable of doing this. So mm -hmm. these are all the wrong kind of consciousness I keep generating and yeah. trying to work with. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it, how we're our own worst enemy? A very uh, obvious one would be um, coming into teachings and you're cooking lunch that day and just planning what you have to do whilst <laughs> you're listening. <laughs> so your mind's over there whilst you're physically okay. here and not listening. But also um, in terms of doubt, uh, having doubt about what to focus on in, in, your, in my practice. So should it be this or should it be that? And this is interesting, that would be worthwhile. And then getting to the point where I'm not really focusing on anything too much. And so then it's a detriment. Yeah. Yeah, you get so confused because there's so many different things to practice that uh, instead of practicing any of them, you you spin around uh, your confusion and what to practice. Yeah, yeah, Con confusion and, and doubt they take up a lot of time, actually. Yeah. Okay, how about some examples of wrong consciousnesses people have had? <laughs> so one morning, um, there was a monastic putting honey into the tea, right? And it was like near the end of the honey bottle and it went... <laughs> and immediately I thought, who is tus tusking at the... I thought someone was at the tea counter going... To all of us. <laughs> I was like, who is that? It's 7.30. Could you like not do this? And then I check again and I realize it's the honey bottle. <laughs> and the best part is I tell Venerable Sem K this example and she went, oh, I did think it was someone tus tusking. <laughs> you mean it was the honey bottle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good old wrong co consciousnesses, yeah, that could actually wind up making us quite angry at this fig, you know, the person we created who's, you know, <laughs> acting like that. <laughs> Other wrong consciousnesses? I'm back with Donald Trump. And... Um, <laughs> I was listening to the radio at the time when um, the asylum seekers were coming mm -hmm. and Donald Trump was railing and um, talking about how the Democrats were orchestrating it and how he was going to send troops, etc. So as I was listening, I was upset and, yeah, really disturbed. And I said to myself at the time, he's just like me, da-da-da-da-da, wants to be happy, doesn't want to suffer. But this has been nagging at me, that moment. Mm -hmm. And this morning, I really explored it. Um, and what I found was that beneath all that, that didn't look so bad to me <laughs> as the observer, but I... I had a kind of a hate I felt mm. for him. And as I kept going into that, it was, um, you're doing these things and they hurt me. You know, you're, you're hurting me, you're making me feel this pain. Um, and so, and et cetera, et cetera, you know, other facets to it. But I just realized there were so many wrong consciousnesses. Mm. And that in the process of sifting through them, I could just feel them like lifting off mm. out of my body, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, yeah, so it was, it was very helpful. And I finally feel like I have let that go. Mm. Good. Good. Yeah. So this thing of, you know, when sometimes we think that all this discussion about different kinds of 
cognizers is something completely separate from our emotional life. You know, like, oh, cognizers, they're up here, you know, and my emotional life is here. But you can see that, and this is a very good example, that when we go beneath the surface in the emotion, there's a lot of uh, thoughts going on. And some of them may be correct assumptions, some may be inferences, some may be doubts, and some may be wrong consciousnesses, depending on what the emotion is. Okay, And when we're able to see the wrong consciousnesses that are lying underneath some of our, our more negative emotions, then it becomes much easier to, to release that emotion because you see that uh, your whole storyline is wrong. Yeah. And we have stories behind what we're feeling. Yeah. Lots of assumptions, lots of, you know, different kinds of things. And, and when you scratch really deep, you can see, that, you know, it all comes back to the thing of, I am this independent person, and my happiness is more important than anybody else's. You know, it all comes back to that. And they're an independent whatever, you know, and they're uh, making me happy, they're torturing me, you know. But the whole framework for the whole kit and caboodle you know, is, is that uh, uh, the grid of inherent existence with me as the most important one. I, me, and mine. Yeah. Can I add a little bit more? So it also intrigued me the interplay of wrong consciousnesses and... Um, I guess maybe inferential, because I could see the wrong consciousness quite clearly mm -hmm. in that process. And I had um, an inferential understanding that, or maybe even, in a way, a direct understanding of some things. I mean, like the recognition of I, me, and mine mm -hmm. immediately came up as I saw Mm. what was going on. Mm. So you could see the two sides of the thing. Yeah. 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 Very good. Uh, first I'll ask a question that was generated by the example I thought of. Um, the question that I have is, can those negative, um, well, you've said that negative emotions like anger, jealousy, etc., indicate a wrong consciousness, um, so an opportunity to inquire. Um, do positive emotions like happy, peace, joy also, can they possibly indicate a wrong consciousness or would they indicate a correct consciousness? Mm, okay. And, and so the example I had thought of was um, when I was a devout Christian and I was praying to know if this church I was going to was true. I was praying to a God creator. Oh. Um, I felt joy and peace. And so, um, but that was wrong consciousness. Mm -hmm. I was interpreting all of them. That's an answer that it is true. Yeah. Yeah. So just feeling happy doesn't mean that uh, the consciousness is virtuous or perceiving something correctly. Okay, I, I think that that's one example, you know, believing in a creator God. Or another example that maybe would be more vivid is somebody who's really mad at somebody and exacts their revenge and then feels happy about it. So that happiness is based on a total, you know, non-virtuous action, which is based on exaggerating the negative of somebody else or 
um, projecting negativity or thinking that harming somebody else will bring happiness. So those are all incorrect kind of things. You know, in the similar way that sometimes feeling... um, We talked about this in in, uh, Approaching the Buddhist Path a couple of weeks ago, that sometimes feeling a a bit um, sober, so to speak, you know, or deflated a little bit, can actually indicate a correct consciousness because we've been able to overcome a wrong idea in the sense, for example, like uh, when we usually regard samsara, we think, oh, goody, I can get some happiness from it, you know? And then, oh, I can get happiness from this and happiness from that, and it's all going to be jazzy good. And then you do some serious meditation on what samsara is, and your mind goes, whoa, it's not anything like what I thought it was. And you feel kind of disillusioned, you know, like, oh, everything I was putting my life, all my energy into, really isn't going to do it for me. It's not going to really make me happy. And it's a feeling of soberness. And so even though that's not a happy feeling, it's actually something good for our practice. Yeah? Because, and it's different from depression, yeah? Yeah? or discouragement. If you meditate on the disadvantages of samsara, and then you come to the conclusion of, well, everything sucks, so what's the, it doesn't matter anyway. That's definitely a wrong consciousness. But if you come to the conclusion of, you know, I thought my samsara was going to be yippity doo and it's not, and it's never going to be, and there is an alternative and I want to pursue that alternative. Okay? Then that's that mind, when you're thinking of the alternative being the path, yeah, then that becomes a virtuous mind. And that feeling of sober of sobriety, you know, in the sense of seeing things correctly, is gonna move you in that good direction. Does that make some sense? Okay. Yeah, so it's not the case that feeling happy means the mind is virtuous or we're having a correct cognizer. And it's not the case that feeling, uh, you know, kind of, yeah, with our feet on the ground, sober, that that is an indication of non-virtue or, um, or wrong consciousness. Okay? So we have to separate out the, the feeling component from the understanding. Yeah? As we practice more and more and our outlook uh, really become, comes to accord with the Buddhist worldview, then when you have those moments of feeling more sober, you feel very glad inside. There's a sense of, of, oh, okay, I'm understanding, I'm getting somewhere, you know? Okay, but that happens as, you know, we have to really have that understanding of the Buddhist worldview, because as long as our mind is completely tied up in samsaric happiness is the only happiness, then when we're not, it doesn't seem we're going to get it, then we just, you know, yeah. And that, that's not a very productive attitude. But we, you know, as sentient beings, we're really rather strange sometimes. It's like, okay, I want this, and it's going to be really happiness. And if I can't get what I want, well, I'm not going to do anything. You know? It's really kind of all or nothing extreme, isn't it? 
Yeah? And uh, that's not really very realistic or beneficial. Hmm? Okay, so we keep reading. Okay. So we're on page 31, about halfway down, a little more than halfway down. From the very beginning of their training in philosophy, when they are still young children, Tibetan monastics are taught that whatever is produced by causes necessarily has the quality of subtle impermanence. At the same time, their teachers caution them, you have a highly learned mouth, (laughs) meaning you know all the words. You have a highly learned mouth, But actual understanding will come through constant reflection after you have passed your Geshe exam. So they're still young, and he's saying, you got to, you know, continue with your studies and continue with your contemplation. And, uh, you know, then you'll really understand the words you're saying. Only then will there be the possibility of the actual realization dawning in your mind. Be realistic and patient and continue to work hard. So I think that's very good advice. You know, there's a a book out called, uh, what is it? After the Ecstasy, the Laundry. Yeah. And it's an accumulation of stories of people who talk about their fantastic meditation experience and then what comes after it. (laughs) Yeah. And, uh, you know, you can see when you read the stories that the people had the expectation that after they had this wonderful experience, their whole life was going to be completely different. And every time they sat down to meditate, they would be able to have that same experience so that everything would be a perpetual high. And it didn't turn out that way. (laughs) Okay, so it, it's a g- good example of, you know, again, people n- not having the correct understanding of how the mind works, you know, uh, because when we really spend some time looking and thinking about how the mind works, and if you really think about, if you believe in, you know, that we've had beginningless rebirths, then we know, okay, there's beginningless ignorance. (laughs) Yeah. Am I going to get rid of all my ignorance that's been there for eons by one meditation session? Yeah. Is that really going to happen? You know, if something's very deeply imprinted on my mind, is it all going to go bye-bye? In one hour, after a one-hour meditation? Or do I need constant reflection on this topic, constant meditation, to really integrate it in my mind stream, really integrate it in my life, and set up a new pattern that will overcome the power of the old pattern? Yeah? So what is more realistic when we're approaching the Dharma? Yeah, It's really much more realistic, isn't it, of thinking long term and, uh, and then just being happy that we've met the path. You know, that for so many eons we've been wandering around not having met the correct path. And now we've met it. And okay, it's going to take however long it takes. But wow, I am so relieved and so grateful and so full of joy because at least I know the path now. Yeah? So you you really begin to see that it's not the situation that makes us feel a way a certain way. It's how we view the situation that's important. 
Okay, it's completely up to our mind on how we create the situation. Yeah. So, uh, so that's you know part you can see part of the advantage if we can let some of these incorrect assumptions go, you know, and then just cultivate a, a more realistic view. And that will help keep us emotionally more stable. And that emotional stability will enable us to practice the path and not waste time. Yeah? When we're not so emotionally stable, and it's, you know, oh, I had a good meditation. I'm almost enlightened. Oh, I was totally distracted. What's happening? Everybody else has samadhi at me. Oh, I, my visualization was so clear. I'm sure the Buddha was there with me. Oh, I couldn't visualize at all. All I saw was spaghetti. <laughs> you know? And, and when our mind is like that, it's... You know, it's going to be very difficult to cultivate things that require constant attention, you know, and setting up a new pattern in our mind. But when we have the understanding, a little, just even some understanding about how the mind works and the fact that we're very much creatures of a habit, and so we have to set up a new habit. Yeah, and even even if we've had an understanding of emptiness, it, one understanding of emptiness, it's not going to counteract all the the innate ignorance since beginningless time. Yeah, it's going to have a really powerful effect, but don't expect you know the world to move because of it. Yeah. Just say, you know, wow, that was a, that was good. That gives me more confidence in the path I'm practicing. That's the conclusion you come to. This gives me more confidence in the path. Not the conclusion of, I must be really close to enlightenment and next meditation I'm going to get it. <laughs> okay? So, you know, even if things are assumptions, let's aim for the correct assumptions instead of the wrong ones. Okay? You know, and then that helps us um, be buoyant in our practice. You know? Then you have a good session. Well, anyway, what's a good session and what's a bad session? You know, I don't really know. People think a good session is, you know, oh, wow, well, I, you know, I kind of got it, you know. Um, but, you know, you only get sessions where, where you have an aha moment through having many sessions where you don't have any aha moments. Okay? So... It's, I mean, it's like anything. If, I mean, if you're training in, I don't know, basketball, you're going to miss a lot of, of shots before you develop a, a really good ability to, to make them. And even when you have a good ability to make them, sometimes you're not going to. Yeah? But you can see, you know, it involves training. Yeah? So, you know, if you're six years old and the hoop is up here and you go like this, don't think you're going to be Michael Jordan, you know, by the next day. Yeah, it it's, takes practice. <laughs> okay. Did I get it right? Is, was Michael Jordan a basketball player? I get all these guys confused, you know. Like, which one plays what, and, you know? <laughs> okay. There is a debate on whether a syllogism needs to be stated for someone to gain an inferential, reliable cognizer. 
prasangikas, the prasangika madhyamakas, claim it is not necessary. They accept an inferential cognizer through example as a reliable cognizer. Okay. They also say that merely stating a consequence, that is, pointing out the internal contradictions in someone else's argument, is sufficient for sharp faculty people to gain an inferential reliable cognizer. For example, someone who understands that the person is a dependent arising but also believes the person true exists, truly exists. So this is like uh, the Vibhasakas, for example. Okay, There's, they're the lower tenant, philosophical tenant school. Yes, you know, the person is a dependent arising, but the person truly exists or inherently exists. But pointing out to that person, if they're a sharp faculty disciple, it's only going to work if they're sharp faculty. If they're not, it won't work. But by pointing out to him the unwanted consequence of his view by saying, consider the person, he isn't a dependent arising because of being truly existent. So you take what the, the person said that's wrong and you use that as the reason to prove the opposite of what the person believes in. Okay, so that person thinks the person is truly existent, but he also thinks the person dependently arises. Those two are completely contradictory. You can't, you know, if you understand things well, those two are contradictory. You can't have a, uh, a concrete essence and be without a concrete essence, <laughs> okay? It's one or the other. But this person's thinking you can be both. So then, you know, you say, okay, you know, the person is truly existent. You believe that. But think about it. If the person's truly existent, they can't also arise dependently. That's not going to work. Okay? So that's what a consequence is, how you make the consequence. Okay? So if you state that, a sharp faculty disciple will understand that the person is not truly existent. It isn't necessary to subsequently state the syllogism, consider a person, she is not truly existent because of being a dependent arising. For a person of more modest faculties, a follow-up syllogism is needed for him to understand. To the contrary, the lower schools hold that an inferential reliable cognizer must come about through the power of reasoning, implying that it is always necessary to state a syllogism. In addition, they adhere to autonomous syllogisms in which the subject, predicate, and reason all truly exist. With, whereas prasangikas establish the parts of a syllogism and all phenomena by convention. So this is a really subtle point of debate. You know, is there a commonly appearing object when, pe when the prasangikas, who deny inherent existence, when they debate with the other schools, who assert inherent existence. Because the other schools are just saying, well, things appear truly existent. That's true. That appearance is correct. And so we're basing all our arguments on that appearance and assuming that that appearance is correct. And yes, things have an essence. And prasangikas come along and say, look, we can't have a debate about emptiness if you already have that conclusion and you don't even realize it. Yeah. So the prasangikas are saying, no, we can't do our debating based on the assumption that everything has an inherent essence. We have to, you know, do our, our discussion based on, uh, you know, the things just existing in a conventional manner with yeah 
So there's lots and lots and lots of debate about it. Okay? Yeah? I'm remembering some of this wrong, but I thought Madhyamakas, or no, yeah, Madhyamakas don't believe in true existence. Is that true? Um, like yeah, the, the Madhyamakas don't believe in true existence. Okay, so. But they believe, but the Svatantrika Madhyamakas. A belief in inherent existence right. on the so, conventional level. So in this thing here... In this thing here, I gave the example of a Vibhasaka. I see. Who does believe in true existence. Okay. Okay? Thank you. Okay. So, um, you know, we use, uh, th you know, this idea of consequences sometimes uh, just in our daily life. <clears throat> Uh, you know when we use them, if if you, um, you know when your mind wants to have its cake and eat it eat it too, or when you're talking to a child who wa you know wants to have their cake and eat it too, then you say you know and the child, which sometimes is our own childish mind is firmly convinced that we can somehow wiggle the situation so that we can get both things that we want. Yeah, and then if we say to ourselves, you know, okay, it follows that um, uh, you can have your cake after you've eaten it. <laughs> yeah. Then you go, oh, yeah, hmm, you know, yes, I want to eat my cake. And after I eat it, uh, actually, no, it's not going to be there anymore. And then you realize, you know, you can't have both, both things, that it's not going to work. Okay, so that's kind of an everyday example. But um, I suspect in our lives, uh, we have lots of situations where we want... Uh, two things to happen, and they both can't happen. Yeah. Oh, like the example of the person who wrote me the letter um, uh, about uh, her, you know, her relationship breaking up because, uh, you know, her partner wanted to get ordained. And so she wanted samsara and nirvana at the same time. Yeah. And so it's like, well, no, if you get that, you can't get that. Okay, so that kind of thing. Okay, so reflection. So this is your lunchtime discussion. <laughs> Identify the parts of a syllogism and the three criteria in the syllogism. And here's an example. Consider smoking, or you can put drinking, doping, misusing prescription uh, uh, pills, or any uh, driving fast, or any other behavior uh, that you do that is not very safe. Okay, but here we're choosing smoking, but you can make up your own. Consider smoking. It is a health risk because it is directly responsible for approximately 80 to 90% of lung cancers. Okay, so at, at lunch, go through this, you know, be with a partner and go through, you know, what's the subject, what's the predicate, what's the reason, you know, how does the reason apply to the subject, what's the pervasion, and then see if that's a, a correct uh, syllogism, okay? Then, so do that first. So you get some familiarity with how a syllogism works. Yeah. Um, so those of you who haven't heard this before, sit with one of the Sangha members because they've heard it, and they better be able to explain it. <laughs> okay. Then uh, the second reflection is behind our emotions we often find, quote, quote, syllogisms. Identify the parts of the following syllogisms and test them with the three criteria to see if they are correct. So we did a lot of these syllogisms in our class, um, you know, uh, putting, writing down 
some of our thoughts and then testing to see if they uh, pass the criteria of being a valid syllogism. Okay, so here's some you can, you can try out and then you can make your own. Consider me. Me. Yes, I will consider me. I am an unlovable person. Oh, that's true. Because my friend is mad at me. And that's true, too. So, test that out and see, is it a reliable syllogism? Yeah? When, when we think like that, we believe it. I'm an unlovable person because this person I really like is, is mad at me. Yeah? Text that out and see if it makes sense. Okay. Consider my friend. He is untrustworthy because he didn't do what I wanted him to do. That's another syllogism that we make in our mind a lot. Yeah, somebody didn't do what I want them, wanted them to do. Therefore, they are not trustworthy. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so really think about this. It's very helpful. Consider my ideas. They are always good because they are the ideas of a smart person. <laughs> yes! And that's why everybody should believe my ideas because I am a smart person. Okay? So... We think like this, don't we? Don't you have these kind of thoughts underneath? Yeah. So test them out and see if, if they're true. Because when we have these kinds of thoughts and we believe them, it influences how we act around other people. And it influences, you know, and these kind of wrong thoughts, inf you know, adversely influence us. Uh, and often keep us stuck whereby we can't progress in our practice. They make us do and say things that are not very nice. Okay. They make us do all sorts of nutty things. Okay. So you just take the first one. Consider me. I am an unlovable person because my friend is mad at me. What's the subject? Okay, what's that predicate? Yeah, I'm, I'm an, uh, being an unlovable person. What is the uh, reason? My friend's, My friend's mad at me. Okay, so what's the? Is the is there a connection between the, per, the subject and the um, predicate? The subject, at, the subject and the reason. Yeah, that's what I said, the subject and the reason. Oh. oh, well, I meant reason. Don't you understand? Just because I say predicate doesn't mean I mean that. You know better than that. See, that's a good example, isn't it? Yeah, you should be able to know what I really mean even when I don't express myself well. Yeah? Okay, yeah, that's a valid syllogism. You should really do that. Yeah, but don't expect me to do that for you. That's unreasonable. <laughs> okay? So me and my friend is mad at me. Is there? No, there, there, there's no relationship. What about the pervasion? What's the pervasion? My friend is mad at me. I'm necessarily yeah, if my friend is mad at me, I'm necessarily unlovable. Is that true? It's not true. But do you believe when your friend is mad at you that you're unlovable? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we say, well, my friend is wrong, and therefore I'm mad at my friend. Sometimes we say, my friend is right, and I am unlovable. Yeah. But often we, go, we make the next syllogism. If, if somebody doesn't love me, 
you're, I am unlovable because somebody doesn't love me. Yeah. So we go very easily from, okay, somebody doesn't love me, which is their, their thing. And then we make it my thing. Therefore, I'm unlovable. Yeah. So we take somebody else's opinion and tell ourselves it's true and make ourselves that. That's really dumb, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, isn't that dumb? Yeah, very much. It can also become an arrogant mentality. I am wonderful because all these people are cheering me. Yeah, if a lot of people cheer me, it means I'm wonderful. Is that true? No. 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 But one person thinks so. Yeah. <laughs> More than one person <laughs> thinks so. <laughs> you know who I'm thinking of. Oh. <laughs> Are you criticizing my tree again? <laughs> my tree's the cat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, she would never criticize my tree. <laughs> um, okay, but do you see how, you know, it's very interesting. Take some of the things you believe about yourself and the things that you say to yourself and make them into syllogisms and test if they're true. Yeah, extremely helpful. When we did it in class, was it helpful? Very. Yeah, it was very helpful. Okay. Okay. So now, reliable cognizers based on an example. So this is, you know, we're going into Chandakirti's view here. We often use analogies, models, and examples when learning something new. These evident phenomena, a map, picture, model, and so forth, illustrate a meaning that is obscure because the two have some similar characteristics. Not exactly the same, but similar. In ancient India, a king was given a painting of the Wheel of Life. That's the Wheel of Life back there in the back of the room. Okay. Which... By the way, that drawing is going to be on the front cover of Volume 4 whenever I get that manuscript finished. <laughs> okay. Um, so th a king was given a painting of the Wheel of Life, which illustrates the, the three realms and the six classes of samsaric beings. And uh, the process by which ordinary beings take rebirth. By contemplating the picture, the king understood the causal chain leading to rebirth and cyclic existence. This understanding of dependent arising in turn later led him to realize that there is no inherent existence. This king must have been definitely a sharp faculty disciple. Okay, most people look at it and say, why did they paint something with a monster? <laughs> yeah, but actually, if you understand that whole the diagram, it's, it illustrates the whole process by which we take rebirth in samsara. Okay, so that was an example of how an example was able to help that king understand something important. A face in a mirror is an evident phenomena, whereas emptiness is a slightly obscure phenomenon. When an intelligent disciple whose mind stream is fully ripened, okay, so it's not just anybody, it's somebody who's intelligent and their mind is ripe, is told that just as a face in a mirror lacks true existence, so does the person. By the power of this example, she will understand the selflessness of persons. Okay. So to be able, you know, we look in the mirror, and it's like, that's me. Oh, I really look like that. Oh, my God. Do I look like that? And we think, you know, it, we almost treat it as if there's a real person in the mirror. You know, it's like, oh, come on, you got to look better than that. Like, 
that and what happens if I get a facelift, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, all these wrinkles, you know, what do I do with all these freckles? My goodness. Um, okay, so we believe, you know, we think... We know that the face is false intellectually, but often when we look at it, we relate to it as if it's a real person. And then we think, that's me, and I look like that. Oh, no. Okay. How often do you look in the mirror and say, oh, I look wonderful? <laughs> yeah. We usually look in the mirror and like, oh, God, how can I look like that? Yeah. That's what advertising does to us. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, but actually, is there a face in the mirror? No. There's no inherent <laughs> face in the mirror. It's completely empty of face. So if you're a sharp faculty disciple, you know, when you see that reflection and you remember, oh, there's an appearance, but it doesn't exist as it appears, that helps you get in touch with emptiness, and then you apply that to your own mind and everything else. Unlike the lower schools, prasangikas accept inference by example as a means to generate a reliable cognizer. Now, that doesn't mean that that person's going to realize emptiness just by looking in the mirror. It may be, you know, that something clicks, they're understanding that as an example, and then that will help them when they sit down to meditate on emptiness. Whether someone generates an understanding through this means or through factual inference depends on the mindset and faculties of the individual. Although a few ripe disciples may be able to realize emptiness through inference by example, most people need to rely on factual inference. But examples help us understand the, the syllogism of a factual in, inference. Okay, then reliable cognizers based on authoritative testimony. So this is a much bigger explanation on what we touched on. A reliable cognizer, cognizer based on authoritative testimony is used to gain knowledge about very obscure phenomena that we are unable to know through direct perceivers or other types of inferential cognizers. So we have to be very clear. It, this is used to realize things that we cannot understand by other means. So we only use it for those kind of situations. Yeah. A reliable cognizer based on authoritative testimony uses as the reason to accept a statement as true the word of someone we have examined and determined to be a reliable authority on the subject. Okay, so we have to examine and determine that person is reliable. The validity of this inference hinges on the reliability of the person whose testimony we trust. Such a person should know the information, one, two, have no cognitive disability, three, speak truthfully. Okay. For example, someone who wants to enroll in a school trusts the application instructions given by people working at the admin office. Still, it is our responsibility to examine their qualifications and not to believe things blindly. Okay? You know, and especially now, especially now in, in our political world, you know, not just to say so and so has this office, there's therefore they uh, understand that subject well and what they say is accurate. You know, we can't do that anymore. I'm not sure if we ever could. In spiritual practice, this form of inference is also called inference by belief or by scriptural authority. Important for spiritual practice 
It involves accepting reliable scriptural passages in order to understand very obscure points that cannot be otherwise known. Okay, so only in that kind of situation. Such topics include the subtle work, <coughs> workings of karma and its effects, the 12 sets of qualities of bodhisattvas gained on the 10 grounds, the causes of the Buddha's 32 signs, the inexpressible qualities of the resultant state of awakening, and the lifespans of beings and realms imperceivable by our, our uh, senses. Okay, so those are the kind of things that we're going to use this type of reasoning for. Okay, so for example, when we studied uh, Precious Garland and Nagarjuna went through uh, quite um, many verses talking about the causes of the 32 uh, signs of a Buddha. Yeah, those were talking about some of the causes. There, you know, we also need the collection of merit and the collection of wisdom. But then when he was talking about other actions that we can do now that will bear those signs, you know, we trust what he said because it was Nagarjuna and, you know, he's, we've, we've studied his works and, you know, they've been reliable and so on. Okay. Then you may read, I think it's in Ornament of Clear Realization, where Maitreya talks about the causes for the 32 and they aren't exactly the same. And then you go, ah, Nagarjuna said that, and he's valid, and Maitreya said that, and he's valid, and they don't match to one-to-one. -one. Who's wrong? Well, neither of them are wrong, because you can have a variety of causes for different things. So one emphasizes one, one emphasizes the other. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. To correctly infer that a scriptural passage is accurate and free from fault, we must test it by means of a threefold analysis. So here are the three, what you have to do. <clears throat> okay, so you look at the scripture or the person or whatever that person said, and there's no reason to reject this statement or scripture in terms of its presentation of evident phenomena. To assess this, we examine if its presentation of evident phenomena can be refuted by direct perception. So if what's it saying about things that we can see with our eyes and hear with our ears is wrong, then we don't have to accept it. <laughs> okay. Second thing, there's no reason to reject this statement or scripture in terms of its presentation of slightly obscure phenomena. So to assess this, we examine if its presentation of slightly obscure phenomena can be refuted by inference. Okay? So again, if it can't be refuted, then we can infer that it's reli reliable so far. We've only done two of the criteria. Third criteria, there is no reason to reject this scripture in terms of its presentation of very obscure phenomena. To assess this, we examine two factors. So first factor, the scriptural's explicit and implicit meanings about very obscure phenomena are free from contradiction. <clears throat> so the explicit meaning is the evident evident theme of the scripture, the implicit meaning is other topics that are the, uh, the basis. So, for example, if we talk about the Prajnaparamita Sutras, the, their explicit meaning is the doctrine of emptiness, and the implicit meaning is the progressive stages of the paths that realize emptiness. So, if we look at the Heart Sutra, which is uh, an it's an abbreviated Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. If we look at it, it explicitly talks about emptiness. When we chant, chanted it this morning, you can tell it's talking about emptiness. That's its explicit subject matter. You know, things are, you know, are unborn and they lack this and they lack that, okay? The implicit subject is 
all those things it, that are mentioned in the sutra that are empty of inherent existence. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. All of those things, which are the basis of the emptiness, the basis, uh, those things that lack inherent existence, okay, they are part of the implicit meaning. Okay, now they aren't the path to awakening, yeah, but mentioned in other parts of that sutra, no attainment, no non-attainment. What else does it say after that? Uh, no cessation, no... Uh, suffering, origin, cessation. Yeah, no suffering, origin, cessation. I can never remember things when I have to recite. No suffering, origin, cessation, path, no attainment, no no exalted wisdom, no, no non-attainment. No non yeah, so all of those, there you're talking about the path to awakening. And if you take any one of those words and examine it in the light of how Shravakas or hearers practice, how solitary realizers practice, how bodhisattvas practice, then you get the whole explanation of the stages of the path. Of course, to explain all those stages of the path, you also have to talk about the, about the eye, near ear, and all those other things, because those are the things that we're going to use as the basis of uh, analysis. Okay? So that gives you some idea what explicit and implicit means. So that's one uh, thing that you examine when looking if the scripture is... Uh, reliable in terms of its presentation of, of, of very obscure phenomena, okay? If the explicit and Im implicit uh, don't contradict each other. <clears throat> and the second one is that the former and latter passages of that scripture or statement's um, presentation of very obscure phenomena are free from contradiction. So what the scripture says in one place does not contradict what it says in the in another. So it's not like in the Prajnaparamita the sutras, the Buddha says all phenomena are empty of inherent existence, and then three verses later he says everything has inherent existence. Okay, that would invalidate the whole thing. So. I asked His Holiness when we were going through this, I said, you know, how much of a scripture do you have to read to generate the, you know, these three uh, uh, criteria in your mind? And he said, there's not a recommended number of pages. <laughs> you know, me, I want to know, is it five pages, six or 50 or 51? Okay, so there's not a recommended number of pages to read in order to determine that a scripture is free from faults by the threefold analysis. Each person must read enough to be satisfied that his or her analysis is thorough. So enough so that you feel comfortable with it. If a scripture meets these three criteria, accepting its statements as true gives us access to knowledge that is useful for our Dharma practice. Dharmakirti says that a scripture may also be considered trustworthy if its author is a reliable or credible, uh, credible person. So uh, for those of you who were here this summer when we studied Pramnavartika with Geshe Tapke, there we were going through Dharmakirti's syllogism of why the Buddha is a reliable person. Okay. Can you remember why? Motivated by great compassion for all sentient beings, mm -hmm. the Buddha cultivated his mind so that he realized emptiness to mm -hmm. become the, uh, oops, the, no, teacher. the teacher, become the teacher. Becoming the teacher and having done that realize, realization, he eliminated all the um, obscurations and cultivated all the good qualities to become the Sugata. Mm -hmm. And as the Sugata therefore became the protector or the savior, depending on your translation. Protector. <laughs> In order to be able to teach the path so that people could attain that as well. Yeah. And so that made him all Which that. Which makes him a reliable, a reliable person. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he, and so then 
Dharmakirti took that, you know, it's only like a, it's one sentence and unpacked it into, you know, I forget how many verses in that chapter, okay? But this is really the beauty of the teachings, you know, how you can have something short and when you unpack it, it's so rich. Hmm? A reliable person is one who is able to fulfill the desires of disciples in a non-deceptive manner. The Buddha is a reliable being because he has freed his mind from all defilements, developed all excellent qualities, and knows all phenomena directly with his omniscient mind. Motivated by compassion, he has the genuine wish to lead all beings from dukkha to the joy of liberation, and he has no reason to lie. This is an important one, you know, considering what we see going on around us where there's so many people lying. The Buddha has absolutely no reason to lie because as a Buddha, he doesn't care about getting offerings. He doesn't care about fame. He doesn't care about, you know, if he's the lead figure on the evening news. Um you know, his motivation is completely out of compassion. And so that, you know, for that reason, he has no reason, you know, to, to give us any false news, fake news. Furthermore, what the Buddha said about the most essential aspects of the path, the four truths and emptiness based on dependent arising, can be validated by an inferential, reliable cognizer. So it's not only that the Buddha has no reason to lie and that he's omniscient, but what he's taught already with you know, reliable cognizers, we can verify that, you know, either by seeing the things that are evident objects or um, using inference to understand things that, that are slightly obscure. As we become convinced regarding these subjects, we begin to appreciate the possibility of attaining awakening and respect the Buddha as the one who taught such a wonderful path. Since the Buddha explained the essential aspects in a non-deceptive manner, we can infer that his statements on auxiliary topics that are very obscure phenomena are also trustworthy. Okay. So Aryadeva said, Aryadeva lived in the second, third century, one of Nagarjuna's disciples. He was quite a character too. He said, whoever doubts what the Buddha said about that which is very obscure, should rely on emptiness and gain conviction in him alone. So if, you know, you don't really, if you have doubt about very obscure things that the Buddha said, then try understanding emptiness, because that's something that you can realize for yourself with a valid inference. And if you do that, then it's much easier to accept the other things that you can't, you know. Now you're going to say, oh, okay, but <laughs> emptiness is, it's not, it's, he's, the book says it's slightly obscure. I think it's, you know, much more than slightly obscure. Okay, then take something that you, you can understand, you know, like when the Buddha talks about um, anger being counterproductive. Yeah, contemplate that. Is what the Buddha said right? You know? Think about uh, uh, when the Buddha taught, do that one first, then do attachment. You know, attachment's harder. Yeah, because we feel good when we're attached. But when the Buddha said that, you know, attachment is a skewed, um, uh, you know, cog cognizer, skewed emotion, it's based on misconception, is that true or not true? And examine your own mind. And if you do that, then you may say, oh, you know, gee, the Buddha knew what he was talking about. Okay? So take other things that are easier for you to apply to your life and test them out. And if they work, then you can 
use that as a basis to trust other things that the Buddha said. Okay. Dharmakirti makes a similar point. So in Pramnavartika, he said, alternatively, since the true nature of that which is to be avoided and that which is to be done, along with the methods for doing so, are well established, the statements of the credible person in question, the Buddha, are non-deceptive with regard to the most important issues, in other words, the four truths, Hence, he is a source of inferential knowledge with regard to other objects. Okay? So, you think about the four truths. True dukkha, true cause, true cessation, true path. Yeah? And you think about them. And you apply them to your life. And if they make sense and you begin to understand the link between how true cause brings on true dukkha and how true path can bring uh, true cessation, then that will give you confidence uh, in the Buddha's, you know, accurate words, and then you can apply that to other things that are harder to understand. Sankhapa agrees that investigating one teaching of the Buddha, in this case, dependent arising, and seeing its veracity gives us confidence in his other teachings. So, Sankhapa said, in praise to dependent arising, through this very path of dependent arising, the rationale for your speech being peerless, convictions arise in me that your other words are also are valid too. Okay. So we'll stop here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's too big for this, but I always get puzzled when we talk about the authoritative, you know, scriptural authority and the discrepancy between what the schools identify as what's a, a, a literal teaching and what's yeah, a definitive. interpretable, yeah, yeah. definitive or, or interpretable. Yeah. And so there's also got to be another level of valid validation depending on the school. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, it just, it confuses, it makes this less definitive for me. Yeah. Well, what it, that's doing is pointing out the Buddha's skill in saying different things to different people. But then you look at what he said to the different people, and you can see that some things make more sense. Some of those statements are... Uh, are more are more reliable than other statements, and then you begin. Then you say, "Well, why did the Buddha teach those things that aren't so accurate?" Well, because the people who were listening at that time, if they heard the most accurate teachings, they would freak out, and that wouldn't benefit them. So the Buddha, out of compassion, taught them something that would benefit them, so that they could gradually progress to gain the right view. Okay, it's like when you have kids in the car, yeah, and it's a 14-hour drive. You don't say, okay, we're going to drive from, uh, oh, what is it, from the Bay Area up to, uh, up to Portland today, you know, at one go. Your kids are going to freak out. You say, oh, we're going to go to Eureka today. So you drive a few hours, you get to Eureka, kids are great, you do something at Eureka, you know, kids had a good time. Then you say, let's get back in the car and go a little further, you know, and we're going to go to Eugene. And so you get the kids to Eugene and, oh, that's good, let's have some dinner in the Eugene. And, you know, uh, and then, you know, so you, you lead them gradually. Yeah, so that's skillful method. When the when the parents on the, in the morning say we're going to Eureka today, yeah, they aren't lying to the kids. Okay, I mean they know they're going to try and get the kids all the way to Portland, but they know that to be skillful with your kids, you got to give them the truth little by little. <laughs> so did 
these three do these three points then help you discern which of the Buddha's teachings themselves are the ones that we can rely yeah. on definitively? Yeah. That's its point. Well, that part of the it point. It's part of the point. The point is to help you understand things that are are very subtle. Okay. But it also points you to uh, you know, well, what actually among these different statements is uh, the Buddha's real interpretation of emptiness? Okay? And so that's why they always say before they start teaching us the arguments to, to validate emptiness, to prove it, is they teach us, how, you know, about definitive um, scriptures and interpretable ones or provision actually in pris- uh, provisional ones. You know, provisional is good. They work for the time being according to your level. Yeah. But they're not the ultimate. Hmm? Okay. <laughs>